Last night wasn't all deadly serious. One of the other objectives for the president last night, of course, this possibly the top line objective, which everyone I'm talking to says he met, is to prove that he was fit for a second term. I know it may not look like it, but I've been around a while. <laughs> when you get to be my age, certain things become clearer than ever. <laughs> All right, our panel joins us now. Democratic Congresswoman Debbie Dingell is back with us, along with New Yorker staff writer Evan Osnos and Republican strategist Sarah Longwell. Uh, Evan, I want to start with you only because you've spent so much time kind of profiling the president. What did you see from him last night? He clearly was basking in the moment, um, and he came uh, to do a task. It seems like he executed on it. Yeah, I think from the moment he left the White House, you saw he had a little skip in his step. He got his <laughs> way over there to the chamber. First thing he did is he says hello to everybody on two feet. In including, the, Congressman including Congressman Dingell. Including Congressman Dingell. You know, look, he is, he draws energy from a room like that. Um, he sort of gained some speed over the course of the evening, gave a long speech, gave it well, and stayed longer probably than anybody uh, expected him to. Uh, look, the bar, as we know last night, was to say to Americans, I can do this. I've got the vigor. I've got the precision. And look, there are flubs along the way. That's inevitable. Um, but this is about giving. There were a lot of Americans who weren't sure what they were going to see last night. And I think a lot of people came out of there feeling reassured. Congressman, what do you think he said to independent voters? I mean, they're sort of an increasingly small slice, but a lot of them came out and voted for Nikki Haley. Clearly, there are people in your state of Michigan, uh, other swing states. What do you think the president gave to those voters last night? Well, first of all, I agree with Evan. He did a great job. And, and I was, I, as you know, I told you last night, I thought he would do a great job. That audience is his element. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't surprised at how long he stayed because he, <laughs> you know, he lives in a bubble and they don't let him talk to people and he had all of his friends there, so he was happier. But I think he also laid out a vision. He laid out his vision for the future. He did, you know, I think one of the things all of us have not done a good job about is talking about what we have gotten accomplished in the last three years. He reminded people of all the things that we've gotten done, called Republicans on some of it, like lowering prescription drugs and the infrastructure bill and the money out there. And hey, most of you didn't vote for it, but you're taking credit for it now. That was one of my favorite lines. Uh, but uh, he laid out his vision. And I think it is a very stark choice between another four years of Joe Biden, what he wants to do, how he's going to support the middle class, how he's going to protect people's freedoms, starting with women's uh, rights and women's freedoms and, and very much in that democracy was at stake and made it, wasn't afraid to call out. You're right, he didn't use Donald Trump's name, but he told people and reminded them he's, they were proud that they overturned Roe versus Wade. They want a national abortion ban, that he wants to repeal the Affordable Care Act, that he's Putin's friend and I could go on. I think it was a very <laughs> excellent speech and clear, stark contrast the country needs to see. Uh, Sarah Longwell, you've talked to a lot of uh, Republican voters uh, and, and voters in general about what they uh, expect from President Biden. And we were talking yesterday about how they had set the bar incredibly low. Um, what is your view of how he performed last night and how it's going to be received by some of these voters? Uh, well, you can tell how well he did by how annoyed Republicans are this morning <laughs> and last night. Like, you could just see how upset they were. Uh, and I think, look, for a lot of voters, they think the stakes are incredibly high. And I think the fear has been that Joe Biden can't hit, you know, can't manage where the stakes are, like, isn't good enough to, to take us through this moment. And last night, what he said was for the Democratic base, but how he said it was for swing voters who needed to see that this guy was all there, that he could do the job. And I, I told you yesterday when I was on this show, the Republicans have made a mistake because they set the bar at dementia. <laughs> and that, if look, if, if that's what dementia is, I hope that's uh, how I have dementia when I'm older, because he was on his game, the energy, and he did the thing that I think Joe Biden is particularly good at where he sparred with the Republicans. He, he somehow managed to have it be incredibly political. He managed to be going right at Republicans, but often was also like joking with them, smiling at them, egging them on a little bit. And it gave this balance to the speech that I think just worked really well for him. And it was offense. It was offense. He's been needing this shift, change the tone, and I think he nailed it.
uh, you could see Lindsey Graham at one point, you know, laughing at him in the audience, right? It's like he's almost forgotten that they were friends for so many years before Lindsey Graham was suddenly very close uh, to Donald Trump. There was one particular uh, moment uh, that uh, he, he basically ad-libbed because of something that happened on his way down the aisle. He encountered Marjorie Taylor Greene in a red Make America Great Again hat and a button with the name Lake and Riley on it. She, of course, was the, the nursing student in Georgia who was killed uh, by an undocumented immigrant. He took the button, um, and then he did this from the dais. Lincoln, Lincoln Riley, an innocent young woman who was killed by an illegal. That's right. But how many of thousands of people being killed by illegals? To her parents, I say, my heart goes out to you, having lost children myself. I understand. Evan, I've heard from a number of Democrats already this morning that they didn't love the way, the language that he used, that he uh, said illegal uh, there. You've known him a long time. Is that authentic to him? What was he doing there? You know, in some ways, that was a moment that could have gone a lot of different directions. He did use a word that did bother people. Uh, immigration advocates don't want to hear him use the word illegal. What he did do, though, was take a moment and acknowledge the suffering of that family. He put it in personal terms. He said, I have knows I know what it means to lose children. And you'll notice it was over in a matter of seconds. It was not ceding the ground to Marjorie Taylor Greene. It was not losing command of that space, which is really important. You know, in some ways... The measure of a moment like that is if you turned off the TV, if you turned off the sound on your TV and you were just watching the people in that room, who would you think came out of there confident and in control? And I think Joe Biden ultimately was able to manage what, what could have been a very volatile time. Yeah, I mean, and Sarah, we know that the House Speaker had basically told everybody to behave. Um, do you think that that effectively happened? I mean, what, how, do, how, how do swing voters perceive kind of what Marjorie Taylor Greene did there? Uh, well, like I, I said this yesterday, look, any time Joe Biden has the opportunity to do a split screen with Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, he should take it because uh, it's these swing voters, these sort of right-leaning independents, soft Republicans, they don't want to be in a political coalition with uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene and people like her. And I think the stunt that she was pulling, wearing a hat, where, like what he did was he met her at her stunt and he called her on it. And I think... It was a little unclear what he was saying, and I think that actually it, like, matters less about sort of the specific words he used than the fact that he sort of got into it with Marjorie Taylor Greene, and he did the thing where he acknowledged uh, her family and made it, put it in personal terms. And so I think he got through that uh, just fine. Yeah. Congresswoman, uh, can you take us down kind of in, onto the floor in terms of the way that, that, frankly, our politics have so deeply divided us? I mean, there were... We had reports here at CNN last night that there were members of the escort committee for the president who refused to take photos with him uh, on the way in. Um, you've seen increasingly uh, kind of those divisions on display. How does it feel different? I mean, you've seen so many of these now. Well, I'm not somebody that... I talked to Marjorie Taylor Greene. have screaming matches where it's at the bottom of the Capitol steps once or twice, but I think you talk <laughs> well, to... <that's, laughs> I, mean. I mean, but I think you should be talking to everybody. I was struck last night. I've never seen... Republicans, one, they were behaved. I mean, other than Marjorie Taylor Greene, and I wasn't quite sure what the dissenter in the gallery said. Yeah, that seemed quite, not quite but squarely I, partisan. I yeah. They just sat. They were very careful. There were a couple of moments where, when they were talking about IVF, and some of the women got up and quickly sat down. And I've never seen such a disciplined group of Republicans that were responding to nothing. I felt it. I was on the aisle. I talked to those guys all the time, and they, it, it wasn't, they were uncomfortable last night. It was very clear that they were uncomfortable. There were people that agreed with some of the things that he was saying, didn't, and I'll tell you what, I've never seen, you know, normally security blocks us, you can't get off the floor. Republicans were out of there in two seconds flat. President stayed another hour, there wasn't a Republican to be found on that floor. It is, I mean, it, it, I'm glad you sort of laid it out like that, because, I mean, it, I've covered State of the Union addresses since uh, George W. Bush, and honestly, usually there are many moments in speeches where both sides will stand up in terms of cheering for the country uh, as a whole, um, really a sign of the times. Congresswoman Dingell, thank you so much for spending some time with us this morning. I really appreciate it.